Hey guys, today I wanted to talk about chess openings, and instead of talking about specific openings, I want to go over some basic general principles that I think everyone should be aware of. And um, as I go through these principles, I'm going to show you guys lots of examples to back them up, and some of those examples are going to be from recent games I played. So I know a lot of people like to memorize specific openings, especially if they're aggressive type players, or they like to open with sharp, specific you know, openings and things like of that nature. Um, and that could definitely make chess fun. But um, I'm a believer in, as someone who is improving my chess, that um, if you really want to improve, I think it's better to know like a couple of openings, understand your principles very thoroughly, and just work through those as you improve. Um, so that's kind of my philosophy. And just as an example, um, I like to play the Roy Lopez opening as white. I've mentioned that a couple times. Um, and there was a time when I tried to basically memorize the Roy Lopez opening. And what I quickly learned was that there are dozens and dozens of different lines and things you just need to memorize. And it became overwhelming to me. And um, I think it made me a worse player trying to memorize this because as I'm going through a game, instead of reacting to my opponent and using common sense and things like that, I was stuck trying to remember... Uh, specific lines and remember exactly where I was supposed to move my pieces without really thinking about it and that led to me making like lots of mistakes in my games and um, it, you know it wasn't great for me so that's basically the bottom line at least in my experience um, and I don't really want to personally I don't want to waste time my brain power like trying to memorize stuff I'd rather organically like learn how to play you know the board that's in front of me and the, my opponent so um, with that being said, um, what are the general principles of chess? And you guys can see it in the bottom right corner, but it's worth repeating. Um, the first one is controlling the center of the board. Developing your pieces. And king safety are the main openings, the main principles. Um, and then some ancillary principles would be multi-purpose moves, um, not aiding your opponent in development and not moving the same piece twice. And we'll go through all of these. And again, I'll go through some sp specific examples. Um, but a couple of things before we get started. Uh, first of all, this is my list that I put together. Um, it's not like an all-encompassing compendium of everything you need to know about opening chess, uh, opening theory. Uh, this is just something that I put together and I think my list covers the basics pretty well. Um, the second thing is these are principles. They're not, this is not a formula or a recipe. So that's very important because there are certainly always exceptions to every single one of these rules that I'm about to go over with you. So the most important thing is keeping these in mind and playing the board in front of you and paying attention and not just making moves based on, based off of muscle memory because there are exceptions. And third, uh, I just wanted to show you guys the shirt I'm wearing because it's pretty cool. So, just check that out. Yeah, I kind of had to show that off. So with that, um, let's get into the first principle. Controlling the center is number one. And what do I mean by the center? So, these four squares that I've highlighted here are the center of the board. And in fact, we could probably extend this rectangle a little bit to include these squares here and this constitutes the center of the board and why is the center of the board so important um, I think the best way to answer that question is to basically show you piece activity and how it works so for example we're going to take a look at bishops here so a bishop in the center of the board can travel to any one of the four quadrants in one move. Whereas if we take a look at this bishop in the corner over here, he has a more limited range of movement. And then again, going back to the bishop in the center, this bishop actually controls 13 squares on the board. Meanwhile, our corner bishop only controls, let's see, seven squares. So our bishop in the middle has twice, basically twice as many squares that we're controlling. And um, this disparity is even more obvious when it comes to knights. So a knight in the center of the board influences all of these squares that I'm highlighting, a total of eight squares 
whereas a knight on the side of the board only has four moves. So again, this piece is twice as powerful. And especially when you have a knight in the center of the board, a lot of these squares here that I'm highlighting constitute very important squares for our opponents. Um, they can be squares that um, like the queen or other pieces want to want to move to, and knights in the center of the board just exert lots of control over the game. Um, and with knights, this is also more important than with bishops, but a knight in the center of the board can move over to any side of the board in a move or two. And in a typical chess game, action can swing from one side to the other very quickly, and it's important to be able to have that flexibility to move your pieces over at a moment's notice. Meanwhile, if we have our knight in the corner over here, it's going to take him three moves just to move over to the left side of the board. And that's something that really can come into play in many chess games. And finally, just taking a look at the queen, we can see that a queen also in the center of the board controls way more squares. All of these squares I'm highlighting here. Look, look how many squares, and I'm not even done. Look how many squares this, this queen controls. She is a dominant force in the middle of the board. And meanwhile, if we're just looking at our queen in the center, you know, she has far less territory that she has domain over. So just another example of how pieces are positioned better in the center of the board. So in order to get our pieces here in the center, what we want to do is we want to push our pawns to control these center positions, which I will highlight one more time. We want our pawns to control these positions. We want them either placed here or exerting or attacking these squares because our pawns in the center will repel our opponent from putting his pieces in the center. And just as importantly, when we decide to move our pieces into the center, our pawns will help anchor those pieces and defend them. So this is a great example of why a move such as d4 or e4 or both is considered a better opening move than a move like let's say h4. h4 only controls the g5 square but if we have pawns on d4 and e4 they're controlling very important squares in a chess game. Very important squares that our opponent wants to typically put his pieces on. So d4 e4 helping control the center of the board that's why these are considered solid um, chess opening moves. And now we're going to go to the next principle. Developing our pieces is number two. And what are our pieces? So we have knights, bishops, those are considered the minor pieces, and our two rooks and our queen are considered the heavy pieces. And typically we want to develop most if not all of our minor pieces the knights and the bishops before we touch the queen or the rooks. And typically we want to develop knights first, although you know there's plenty of exceptions to that rule. But um, I think the reason why we want to develop knights first mostly is because there's only two squares for our knights really to develop. It's either like f3 for example or e2 here. Um, not a lot of choice and typically f3 is a great place for the knight. So there's not a lot of decision making that goes into that. Whereas with the bishops, there's typically more options available to us in terms of where we want to develop. Um, so more choices, and sometimes what happens in the game and the pace of the game kind of dictates, in some senses, where we want to put them. So it's easier to just throw your knight onto f3 or c3 or whatever um, and not really think too much about it because the knights are just great here for you know attacking these center squares that we just talked about. Um, so I'm making some developing moves here, getting the knights out first. And we can see that I've touched all the minor pieces with white before either castling or touching the queen or the rook. And we'll get into castling a little bit in, uh, yeah, in a little bit. Um, now when it comes to developing the queen, I don't really want to get into general principles of that. I think the main goal or the main thing I want to tell you guys is it's typically not or typically a good idea to keep the queen closer to home at first as the game is starting. You don't really want to move her. In, in this game, you can't actually move her very far at all. There's very few places she can move. But for example, we wouldn't want to move the queen to 
the fourth rank or the fifth rank early on. And that's because your opponent can harass your queen. You have to move your queen when she's being attacked. So it's good to keep her on the second, third rank tops in the beginning of the game. Um, so that's generally how you want to develop your pieces. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to bring up, though, that are important to note. So, for example, let's say we continue this. One of the things we don't want to do when we're starting and developing our pieces, we don't want to block in our bishops. So this seems like a decent move, playing d3 here, but because it's it's protecting our, our pawn here, but it's locking in our bishop here. And a better idea in the openings is to first get your bishop out and then push this pawn so that you're not locking your bishop in. Okay? And another important thing that is just good to know or important to know, yes, the knights are very good on f3 and c3, but one of the things that the knight is doing here is it's actually blocking this c-pawn. And later on in the game, sometimes early on in the game, we might want to move this c-pawn. We might want to bring this c c2 pawn up to c4, but this knight's not allowing us to do that. So um, you're going to have to, at some point in the game, move this knight either over here, maybe you jump him up, um, or sometimes you can move this pawn and then play your knight to d2 instead. So it's just important to know. Now, typically, if let's say we're going to castle on this side, which we'll get to in a second, um, we're not typically going to move the pawn that's protecting our king too early into the game. Eventually, you know, that becomes something that we want to do. But um, typically we want to move those pawns away from our castled king. So this pawn on c3 is the one that's going to, we're going to want to move at some point. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much good for the developing pieces. But I did want to show you a game that I recently played in. Um, that goes to show kind of just an uncomfortable position that I was put in because I wasn't finished developing. So I'm playing with white pieces here. Um, you can see, first of all, that I, do, I am controlling the center very well. So I followed my, my first step. Um, my king is also castled and is safely tucked away in the corner here. But one of the things I haven't done yet is I haven't finished developing my pieces particularly my queen side pieces here. The knight and the bishop have not developed yet. So I play a move, d5, which seems to me like a great idea because this knight is pinned. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. Um, my bishop's attacking this knight, and he's x-straying the rook here, and I would love to take that rook. So by pushing this pawn, I'm really putting a lot of pressure here on this black knight. But... Black, in response, just plays a very simple move. It's just bishop to f6. And what I didn't realize is that my rook was actually just trapped here. My rook has nowhere to go. And so this is a great move by Black. And this is a function of me not finishing my development. I decided to try to attack this knight. It looked like a great move to me, but I was a little bit premature, and I should have continued developing pieces. Now, there are a couple of decent moves here, or game-saving moves here, that I could play. I'm going to get back to this game a little bit later because it highlights another uh, principle that I may have violated <laughs> in this game. But um, this is just an example of how don't let your eyes get too big and go for attacks too soon in games. You really want to make sure all these guys are out potentially doing something. Okay. Um, and Yeah, that's basically it for this one. So next we're going to go to number three, which is king safety. All right, third is king safety. Now this is especially true for beginning level players. Get your kings castled. Um, why is king safety so important? The reason it's so important is because we don't want our opponents to be able to check our king. Um, checks are not only dangerous for checkmating reasons, but they're also dangerous for all your pieces on the board. If you have pieces that are undefended at the moment, and your opponent hits you with checks, it's a great way to capture those pieces and take those pieces away from you. So we want to castle, we want to get our king out of safety so that our opponent doesn't threaten our king with checkmate and can't hit our king with checks that force us to respond 
meanwhile they're gaining tempo or they're taking our pieces or pawns or whatever. So this is why castling is so important. So castling is the only move in the game where you can actually move two pieces at once. And here with white, we have two choices. We can castle kingside or we can castle queenside. Both are valid moves. Um, typically, kingside castling is more common. And that's this move here. And that's because there's less pieces to get out of the way before you can castle. Typically, you want to castle relatively quickly in the game. So you only have to move your bishop and your knight over here in order to be able to castle on this side. If you're going to castle queen side or long side, then you actually have to move your queen out of the way. Um, there's a couple other reasons why king side castling generally is safer. Um, so let's see, queen side. Notice here, castling queen side, our knight is defending this pawn on a2 right now from the bishop, but we are giving away defense of that pawn. So if we ever decide to move this knight somewhere, this pawn is undefended, which is one problem. Another problem with queenside castling is that your king is closer to the center of the board. So typically you're going to move your center pawns early in the game, and this means that your king is going to be vulnerable on this diagonal here. Again, actually in this game, our knight is defending the square. Otherwise, this bishop could hit us with a check. And checks are just annoying and typically want to avoid being checked. In this particular case, it's not a problem, but it's just something to consider. Now, queenside castling is very valid and it's often, it is used fairly often in games. Um, sometimes there's benefits to queenside castling. Uh, I think the main benefit probably is the fact that when you queenside castle, your rook is already in the center of the board. It's already in an attacking position. So that's something that can be very um, valuable. Uh, another reason, let's go back. Okay, let's say, let's say our opponent plays our, his bishop here, okay? We try to kick him out with our pawn. He moves, and we play another pawn move here, and he ends up going here. Now, you can see we've moved a bunch of our pawns here on the side of the board. This is a great example of how we do not want to castle on the side of the board because a great deal of the protection offered by castling is the pawn wall that is created, that is protecting our king. Once we move these pawns forward, one or two squares, much of that protection is now gone. So, like, this bishop can come in here perhaps later on if this knight's not there. It's just generally very unsafe to castle your king on the side of the board where you've already moved your pawns. So in this case, if we've already made these moves, we're going to go ahead and castle queen side because it's just much safer of a move to do here. Okay. And to wrap this point up, I want to show you guys another game I played pretty recently. I was with the white pieces. Um, this, is a, this is an example of king safety, and it's not an example maybe that you're thinking of. It's not danger of check necessarily, but it has to do with pins. So I've already castled my king here, and my rook is on the e-file, right? My opponent has not castled yet, and in fact, he has moved his bishop from e7 over to f6. This looks fairly normal. It doesn't seem there's anything that odd going on here, but he actually just hung a pawn by making that move. And why is that? So after he makes this move, I played d5. And the reason I played d5 is because this pawn here on e6 is actually pinned. If he had already castled his king or if he had left his bishop there, <clears throat> this wouldn't be an issue. But black cannot recapture this pawn because if he does, his king is in check. So it's an illegal move. So this pawn is pinned and this is just a, a simple example of um, why king safety is so important and it's important in ways you might not um, necessarily realize at first. So, in this game my opponent played uh, knight captures here. And I recapture. He plays here, and then I played c4, knight to c4. And the reason is, this pawn is still pinned, he still can't capture it. And my queen is now discovering, uh, because I moved this knight away, my queen is now attacking this bishop. So. Very simple thing here that my opponent failed to do early on, failed to pay attention to, and it led to 
a very you know troubling position for him. So king safety, very important. Um, castle your king, or if you can't castle, then try to always envision checks that your opponents can give on you, uh, can possibly produce, and try to avoid those and get your king out of danger, just in general. All right, and with that, we're going to get to the rest of the minor principles here. All right, so finding moves that achieve more than one purpose are very important in opening theory and also just generally important throughout the entirety of chess games in general. Um, Multi-purpose moves often explain opening theory and, for example, why certain moves are made um, theoretically. So, for example, in the Roy Lopez opening, we start with e4, e5, knight f3. Why do we play knight f3? There's actually three purposes for this move, so it's very useful. The first purpose is that you're developing a piece. Very good. Second uh, purpose of this move is that you're attacking an undefended piece. So you're making a threat. That's another purpose of this move. And the third purpose is that you're preparing a quick castling by getting that knight out of the way. So as soon as we move this uh, bishop somewhere, we're already ready to castle. So that's a great example of a multi-purpose move, a move that accomplishes more than one thing at a time. So that's the kind of moves that we want to find as chess players. And another quick example is what's known as the Scandinavian defense. So that's if we played e4, black plays d5, we capture and they capture back with the queen. So can you find a good multi-purpose move here, opening move here for white? If you find, I'll give you one more second. Okay. If you find knight to c3, good job in seeing with the theme here. Um, this accomplishes more than one thing at once. It's developing a piece. Good job again. But the other thing that it's doing is it's creating another threat on our opponent, for our opponent. Our, our opponent has to respond to this knight move because we're attacking their most valuable piece. So what we're doing is preventing our opponent from developing one of his minor pieces now because he has to move his queen. So two very quick, easy examples of multi-purpose moves, and this is the kind of thought process that we want to cultivate um, as we continue our chess playing. All right, so the next one is not aiding in the opponent's development. Um, and that means either giving them an easy control of the center by making a move or developing a piece that otherwise might have a difficult time developing um, for your opponent. So I have a couple of examples of this as well. And the first is the Queen's Gambit accepted opening. It is an opening. Typically, black doesn't want to accept the Queen's Gambit, which is c4. And I'll show you the general ideas of why that is the case now. So if black accepts the pawn, right, white's next move is going to be e4. So what we've done is we have given up our control of the center. See, before, our pawn was attacking the square. We were not allowing our opponent to play e4. But now that we take this pawn, we've given up the center. So now our opponent has a great opportunity in the center. And in making that move e4, our opponent is also attacking that pawn right away. So we're allowing great multi-purpose moves for our opponents here. Okay, And that's one of the things we want to try to avoid doing. And I told you guys I would get back to this previous game that we had played, that I had played, where I violate another principle. And that principle that I violated was, it's not an opening necessarily anymore, but I gave my opponent great developing uh, opportunities here with some of the moves I made. So if you recall, I had pushed this pawn to d5 thinking it was such a great move and he plays bishop to f6 attacking my rook which cannot move. So what did I do? I took the pawn with my bishop which already is kind of a mistake. The reason I did that is because I wanted to threaten this so if he just took the, the rook here I would have taken his rook. I should have taken with the pawn but I didn't. Um, Although that's not really the purpose of me showing you guys this. Um, so after he recaptured my bishop, I played bishop to b2. So my queen's actually defending the square. So he can't really take the rook anymore. If he, if he takes the bishop, I'm just going to recapture with the queen. Right? So let's see, what does my opponent do? He captures my pawn in the middle. 
And this is the part where I make the mistake. I play, I capture his bishop on f6. I fail, you know what, this is too much of a threat to me. I really want to get rid of his bishop. Now, what's the problem with that? Can you guys see the issue with the move that I just made? So think about it for a few seconds and uh, see if you can figure it out. Okay, so the problem is that I allowed him to just recapture very nice, nice and easy with his queen, developing the queen, but also putting this same problem to me, which was the fact that my rook still can't move because I didn't finish developing. So this did not lead to a good outcome for me, as you may surmise after watching uh, some of the moves I made here. But that's another good example of a move that is really aiding your opponent's development. And um, finally, not moving the same piece twice. I, I think this one is pretty straightforward. The reason we don't want to do that is because it's preventing us from developing the rest of our pieces, castling, um, doing all the things that we should be doing in the beginning of a game. If we move a knight or a bishop two or three times at the beginning, it means we're not doing all those things that we're supposed to be doing to start the game. Um, very simple example here. Because I see a lot of people do this. So let's say we play knight f3 here, and our opponent plays d6. You might say, oh, look, we can actually check our opponent. Um, let's develop our bishop and check our opponent. Now, is this necessarily a great move? Not really, because the problem is, once we play bishop to b5, our opponent has a very simple response to this, and that response is c6. And once he pushes this pawn forward, this pawn is defended, and we have to move our bishop a second time. I don't want to necessarily say this is a terrible move for white, but it's, a, it's an example of, first of all, a check that doesn't accomplish much, and secondly, we're going to have to move our bishop back to uh, maybe all the way back here, maybe back to d3. So instead of allowing our opponent to move here, he could also play this move, let's say. We might as well just develop our bishop here from the beginning instead and not l allow our opponent to get an extra move on us. So, a uh, very simple example of that. And um, I think this pretty much wraps up the opening video. So, hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, hopefully it was very educational for some of you. And uh, as always, I will see you next time.